Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplify, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading. Today we will discuss the articles displayed on the screen from the Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 4th July 2019. So let us start our discussion. Now this article on page number 11 is related to the topic of security and it will fall under general studies paper 3. So this discusses the possibility for India to launch cyber attacks against Pakistan as was recently done by United States of America against Iran. And you might be knowing that the United States of America resorted to cyber strikes and avoided military response when its drone was grounded by Iran's army. So this article basically deals with this question which is, is cyber attack a retaliatory option for India against Pakistan sponsored terror attacks? Now such usage of cyber strikes has been termed as bloodless war because this does not involve conventional warfare and further it is speculated that the strikes by United States of America were targeted against Iran's military command and systems and especially those systems which control Iran's missiles and rocket launchers and these were basically aimed and targeted at disabling such military systems of Iran by using cyber systems and attacking them. So in order to understand if cyber attack is an option for India or not let us look at the strategy which has been used by India in its response to terror attacks by Pakistan. So in the aftermath of the Pulwama attack and recent strikes by India on Balakot terror camps, an implicit strategy has been revealed. However, it has not been officially declared by the government of India. However, India's strategy for response against terror attacks by Pakistan involves these criteria and they include preemption, non-military nature of strikes and creation of deterrence. So let us understand the justifications of these criteria. So first is preemption and this involves striking any terror camp in Pakistan which India feels will lead to terror attacks in India. For example, in the recent strikes in Balakot, India targeted the militant camps of Jaish e Mohammed and it did not directly attack the army of Pakistan. So what this does is that it allows India to justify any operation on international forums because it has been allowed as an exception of Article 2.4 of the UN Charter regarding any warlike situation. And the justification for the usage of preemptive strikes is the self-defense, which means that India undertakes such strikes for its self-defense. So the recent air strikes in Balakot and also the surgical strikes were undertaken for self-defense. Further, these air strikes and surgical strikes by India have been non-military in nature. This is because the operational aim of these strikes was not targeted towards Pakistani people or Pakistani army and they were all targeted towards the terror camps that are operational in Pakistan. And the final aim or final criteria that has emerged is that such strikes will create a deterrence effect which means that the terrorist organizations do not repeat their act of terrorist activity on the soil of India and this will basically be done by doing substantial damage on the enemy. So the three criteria that have emerged regarding strikes or retaliatory responses by India have been the preemptive strikes, non-military nature of these strikes and creation of deterrence effect. So now let us discuss can India conduct retaliatory cyber strikes like USA and how would India justify such an act on international forums. So regarding the strikes by United States of America these were aimed at Iranian establishment and specifically targeted its military installations. So similarly, if India conducts a cyber strike against Pakistan's military command or its systems, it will be termed as an attack against Pakistan and it will not be termed as an attack on the terrorists. So this will not be in line with the criteria of preemption and non-military response and it would become difficult for India to justify such an act on international forums. Further, if India conducts a cyber strike against Pakistan's military establishment or the government establishment, Pakistan would try a counter cyber strike on India's installations and this will lead to escalation as against the criteria of deterrence. Because a cyber strike against the establishments and the military establishment of Pakistan will provoke Pakistan to indulge in counter cyber strike. So this will lead to escalation of the matter and will reduce the efficacy of the criteria of deterrence which has been observed in the recent strikes like the surgical strikes or the Balakot air strikes. So that is why the authors have argued that the cyber strike is not an option for India as of now as a retaliatory measure. 
Now, since it has been argued that India does not have the option of retaliatory cyber strikes against Pakistani military and its government establishments, although it can use such a strategy against the terror groups. This is because most terror groups these days are depending upon computers, networks and internet for their propaganda. Thus, India can target these terrorist organizations which are operating through internet by the usage of cyber strikes. And India should avoid any confrontation with the Pakistani military and government establishments. Because conducting of cyber attacks against terror groups will be in line with all the criteria that we have discussed, which include preemption, non military nature of strikes, and creation of deterrence. Further, it is still not known if Indian Army possesses the ability to conduct a cyber strike or not. However, India would not reveal such strategy because it will remove the element of surprise. So, in short, the authors have discussed the possibility for India to conduct retaliatory cyber strikes like USA. In this, they have argued that India should exercise caution in conducting any cyber strikes against military establishments or the government establishment of Pakistan. However, such strikes can be used against terror groups because most of the terror groups are these days relying on propaganda based on internet. Further, any cyber strike on terror groups will be in line with the criteria of preemption, non-military nature of strike and deterrence. With this, let's move to the next article. This article on page number 14 is related to the ban on Baloch Liberation Army by United States of America. So this will form a part of the general studies paper 2 under the topic international relation. And it also becomes important for us from the preliminary examination point of view. So if you look at the question which was asked in the year 2016, there was a question which read communities sometimes in the news and the country to which these communities belong. So in this they have given the pairs and you have to find if these pairs are correct or not. Now the first pair is incorrect because Kurds are not present in Bangladesh but are present in Iraq, Syria and Turkey. The second and third are correct matches hence the correct answer is C that is 2 and 3. So as you have seen in this question which was asked in 2016, you should know to which country these Baloch rebels belong. So these Baloch rebels belong to Pakistan as you can see in this map. They belong to this Balochistan region and it borders Iran as well as Afghanistan. So now let us understand what this article is highlighting. Now this article is pretty self-explanatory. So let us understand why is this Baloch community in news. So this is in news because the United States of America has designated the Baloch Liberation Army as a terror organization. And it has done so because the Baloch Liberation Army is an armed separatist group that targets security forces and civilians in the ethnic Baloch areas of Pakistan as we have seen in the map on the previous slide. Further, this Baloch Liberation Army is the armed wing of the Baloch movement. So this Baloch movement has civilian movement as well as an armed rebellious movement. So this Baloch Liberation Army belongs to this armed wing. And further, it has carried out various violent attacks in Pakistan. Now, what is the ideology of this Baloch Liberation Army and why is it waging a war against the state of Pakistan? So in this regard, the Baloch Liberation Army rebels claim that Pakistan has been exploiting the resources of province of Balochistan without giving due share to the locals and the indigenous Baloch tribes. Further, these rebels have claimed that they are aiming for both freedom from Pakistan and internal reform of the Baloch society. Further, what has been India's approach towards this Baloch Liberation Army? So you should note that India has been in touch with the leaders of Baloch Liberation Army. And previously it has provided medical support in the past to various leaders of Baloch Liberation Army. And they have been provided visa based on fake identities at times. And finally, what will be the impact of this ban by US on the Baloch Liberation Army or declaration of Baloch Liberation Army as a terror organization? So it will help Pakistan to restrict the movement of Baloch leaders in the region, which means sub the movement in subcontinent and will also make it difficult for the Baloch Liberation Army to raise funds. So since US has declared the Baloch Liberation Army as a terror group, now Pakistan will try to control the activities of this group and will try to block funds to this organization. So these are few important points. However, the most important point for us from the preliminary examination point of view is the location and the country to which these Baloch tribes belong. And with this, let's move to the next article. Now this article on page number 10 highlights that Indian economy is going through a slowdown. So in this background, the finance minister of India or the finance ministry needs to maintain a fine balance between the need to provide fiscal stimulus and the need to maintain fiscal discipline. 
So simply it highlights that there should be a balance between fiscal stimulus and fiscal discipline. And to maintain this fine balance between fiscal discipline and fiscal stimulus, the article or the author has provided various options and suggestions. So let us look at them. So let us first look at what is the present situation of Indian economy according to the author. Now the government has created a fiscal deficit target of 3.4% for the present financial year. And this target has been set up under the FRBM Act. However, as we all know that Indian economy is going through a slowdown, so there is a need to revive the economy. And for this, the government will have to increase its expenditure. And further, it will have to cut down the tax rates. And the cutting down of tax rate will act as an incentive for the corporate sector to spend more and invest more. So that it leads to more economic growth. Now, however, if the government increases its expenditure, and cuts down its revenue by cutting down the tax rates, it will lead to increase in the fiscal deficit. So this increase in fiscal deficit will be a breach of the target which the government has set for itself under the FRBM Act. And regarding fiscal deficit, you all might be knowing that it is the difference of total expenditure of the government minus revenue receipts plus non-debt creating capital receipts. So simply it expresses the borrowing of the government. So as we have seen, if the government increases its expenditure and reduces its revenue by cutting down the tax rates, the fiscal deficit is bound to increase, which means that the government's borrowing will increase. And that creates a liability on the government and which is a breach of the fiscal deficit target as well. Now for better understanding of concepts like fiscal deficit, you should go through the NCRT of class 11th, which is the macroeconomics NCRT. Now to handle the situation, let us understand what are the suggestions that have been provided by the author. So to improve the economic situation of India, there is a need for fiscal stimulus. And for providing this fiscal stimulus, government will need more resources. And the focus of the government should be on disinvestment of PSUs. For example, PSUs like Air India. And by disinvestment, you should note that it means dilution of the stake of government in the public sector enterprises. And this disinvestment also includes privatization of the PSUs. The second option with the government is that it can resort to transfer of reserves from the RBI to the government. And presently it is under consideration based on the Bimal Jalan panel. So here you should note that the Reserve Bank of India transfers surplus from its earnings to the government of India. And the focus is mainly on these steps because these steps are non-debt creating sources of revenue for the government. The next step can be revenue mobilization through auction of 5G spectrum. Further reducing the tax rates and increasing the tax deduction. And the justification for the reduction in direct tax rates is that the government can increase its revenue through the indirect tax collections like GST. And also the government can focus on borrowings. So mainly the focus of the government should be on these sources because these are non-debt creating and there should be less reliance on borrowings. And all this should be done in order to meet the targets of fiscal deficit which have been set under the FRBM Act. Now, as we have learned in the previous slide that the author has suggested that the government should rely less on borrowings. This is because it will have further adverse impact on the economy. This is because it leads to crowding out of private investment. Secondly, it leads to increase in the rate of inflation. And thirdly, it leads to downgradation in the credit ratings. Now, by crowding out of private investment, you should note that simply when government borrows more from the market, there is less amount of money available for the private sector. And that is why when the government borrows more, the private sector investment decreases. So finally, the author has suggested that the Indian government should rely on fiscal stimulus to revive Indian economy. This is because presently we are going through an economic slowdown and the path for fiscal consolidation could be taken up later. So these are few points that have been provided by this article regarding the revival of Indian economy and how the government should manage its finances. And with this, let's move to the next article. Now, this news article on page number 7 highlights a CAG report regarding the green projects of Maharashtra. And in this report, the CAG has highlighted that there has been considerable delays in the installation of various renewable energy projects by the government of Maharashtra. And various reasons have been attributed to this delay. Now, without getting into the details of this article, because it is Maharashtra specific, let us try and understand the targets that India has set up for itself under the intended nationally determined contributions under the Paris deal or the Paris climate deal. And this will form a part of the General Studies paper 3 under environment. 
and it will also be important for us from the preliminary examination point of view. Now at the Paris climate change deal, India had pledged that by 2030, 40% of the installed power generation capacity will be based on clean sources or renewable energy sources. And it has also set a short term target, which is 175 gigawatt of renewable energy capacity installation by the year 2022. And the breakup of this target is that it will include 100 gigawatt from solar energy, 60 gigawatt from wind energy, 10 gigawatt from biopower and 5 gigawatt from small hydropower. And regarding small hydropower projects, you should note that these are those projects where the installed capacity is less than 25 megawatts. So these are the targets. It will be 100 gigawatt under solar power, 60 gigawatt under wind power, 10 under bioenergy and 5 gigawatts under small hydropower projects. And these can be important for us from the preliminary examination point of view. Further, this is the current status of implementation. So the installed capacity is about 24 gigawatt under solar power, which means that we have more wind power installed as compared to the solar power as of now. And the bioenergy and small hydropowers have small share, which is around 9.54 for bioenergy and 4.5 for small hydropower projects. So basically what is important for us from exam point of view is the target that India has set for itself under the Paris climate change deal. And what is the contribution of solar energy, wind energy and biopower as well as small hydropower in achieving this target by 2022. With this, let's move to the next article. This article on page number 10 talks about the constitutional crisis that is going on in the union territory of Puducherry. Further, this article highlights the concerns which have been raised regarding federalism because of this constitutional crisis in Puducherry. So this will form a part of the general studies paper too under the topic constitution. And in this it will form a part of the subtopic federalism. So regarding the basics of the federalism, you can go through any standard book like Lakshmi Kant. However, in this article, we will try to understand various issues that have been raised by the author. So in this, he has raised the issues or the present issues in the federalism of India. Further, he has highlighted the various aspects of the constitutional crisis that is going on in the territory of Puducherry. And finally, he has provided certain suggestions to improve on this situation. So let us look at these aspects one by one. So highlighting the present issues in Indian federalism, the author has highlighted that the incumbent government has returned to power in 2019 with a resounding majority in the 17th Lok Sabha. Now, due to a strong government at the union level, it does not require the support of regional allies. And that is why the author highlights that such a strong government at the center can be detrimental to the interests of the states. This is because various regional parties are not represented at the center. Secondly, the present government has stated the goal of cooperative federalism. However, it has taken various steps which stand contrary to the spirit of cooperative federalism. And some of these include, first is that the terms of reference of 15th Finance Commission and these terms of reference threaten to lower the revenue share for southern states. This is because the government is trying to change the criteria of population in the distribution of revenue. The second concern is regarding the partisan or the political use of governor's office. And this has been done in case of hung assemblies and also various governments have been stifled in opposition ruled states like Arunachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand. However, the Supreme Court subsequently held all these decisions of the central government as unconstitutional, which directly reflects that there has been misuse of the position of governor. The fourth major issue that is being faced by the Indian federalism is related to the governance of the national capital territory of Delhi. And in this, various court cases have been filed regarding the relationship between the Lieutenant Governor and the Delhi government. And even in the case of Delhi, the Supreme Court has affirmed the primacy of the elected government, which means that the central government should give primacy to the elected government and should not bypass this process by giving extraordinary powers to Lieutenant Governor. And an issue similar to the Delhi government versus LG has come up in the state of Puducherry. So these are few issues or few current or present issues that have been highlighted by the author regarding Indian federalism. 
So after these issues, let us understand what is the constitutional crisis or controversy that is going on in the Union Territory of Puducherry. So in the Union Territory of Puducherry, the elected government has accused the Lieutenant Governor of interfering in the day-to-day -day administration of the Union Territory. And this is being done by the Lieutenant Governor even when there is an elected government in the Union Territory. Now when the elected government of the Union Territory of Puducherry had raised this issue with the central government, the central government had supported the Lieutenant Governor's stand. And this was challenged by the elected government of Puducherry in the Madras High Court. So the Madras High Court had said that incessant interference from the Lieutenant Governor would amount to running a parallel government which means that primacy should be given to the elected government and LG should not function on his whims and fancies. However, this decision of the Madras High Court has again been challenged by the Union Government in the Supreme Court. And recently a bench of Supreme Court has passed interim orders restricting the Puducherry cabinet from taking key decisions until further hearing. Which means that the interim decision has also restricted the powers of Puducherry cabinet which is elected. Now let us look at the constitutional provisions for the governance of the Union Territory of Puducherry. So the government of Union Territory of Puducherry is governed under the Article 239A of the Constitution of India. And you should also be knowing that the Article 239AA deals with the governance of National Capital Territory of Delhi. And this article was added by the 14th Constitutional Amendment Act of 1962. Further, this article provided for creation of legislature and a council of ministers for the Union Territory of Puducherry. Now, the Government of Union Territory Act of 1963 provides that there shall be a council of ministers in each Union Territory with the chief minister at the head to aid and advise the administrator in the exercise of his functions who shall act in his or her discretion only in so far as any special responsibilities were concerned. So this act provides for certain discretions with the Lieutenant Governor of the Union Territories. However, this act does not clarify what is meant by the term special responsibilities in case of the application of discretion by the Lieutenant Governor. So that is why this ambiguity has led to the confusion in the governance of Union Territory of Puducherry. And that is why the elected government has accused the Lieutenant Governor of interference. And as a consequence, it has been challenged in the Madras High Court, which ruled in the favor of elected government. However, the Union government has now challenged the decision of Madras High Court in the Supreme Court. Now, after understanding the constitutional provisions regarding the governance of Puducherry, let us understand the Madras High Court judgment in this case. Now the Madras High Court relied on the 2018 decision of the Supreme Court regarding the governance of Delhi. And in this judgment, the Supreme Court had clarified about the powers of the Lieutenant Governor vis-a-vis -vis the powers of elected Council of Ministers headed by Chief Minister. So in case of Puducherry, the Madras High Court has held that the Lieutenant Governor has very limited independent powers. Secondly, the Lieutenant Governor can issue an ordinance only when the Assembly is not in session and with the prior approval of the President. So this means that the Lieutenant Governor cannot issue ordinance and run a parallel government when the Assembly is in session. Thirdly, if there is any difference of opinion between the Lieutenant Governor and the Cabinet on any matter, the Lieutenant Governor can refer this matter to President or resolve it herself if it is expedient. So this means that in case of any controversy, such matters should be either referred to the President or should be resolved by the Lieutenant Governor himself or herself. Now the Supreme Court in the Delhi judgment had held that any matter shall not mean all matters and it should be used only for exceptional situations, which means that the court had directed the Lieutenant Governor to use the powers of discretion with a restraint. And due to this decision of Supreme Court, it means that there is no legal basis for the Lieutenant Governor to exercise the powers independently and bypass the elected government of Puducherry. So in short, the Supreme Court in the Delhi judgment had restricted the powers or rather clarified the powers of Lieutenant Governor vis-a-vis -vis the Council of Ministers. And the Madras High Court relied on this judgment 
and had clarified about the powers of lieutenant governor and in this the high court has clearly stated that the lieutenant governor has very limited independent powers so after this let us look at some of the suggestions which have been provided by the author in this regard so first is that the supreme court in the national capital territory of delhi case has held that the representative government is a basic feature of the indian constitution and that is why the elected governments must have primacy in the governance of union territories as well so keeping this judgment of supreme court in mind the author argues that the supreme court should uphold the madras high court judgment and ensure that the lieutenant governor of puducherry acts only as per the aid and advice of the elected government further the present situation in puducherry raises a fundamental concern regarding the federalism in india so in this regard it has been suggested that although puducherry is not a state under the indian constitution however the principle of federalism should not be restricted to just states but it should also include the legislative assemblies of the union territories and finally it has been argued that there have been various centralizing measures for example simultaneous elections to parliament and state assemblies are being proposed by the center so that is why in such background where there is more centralizing tendency it is important to reaffirm the values of federalism at every forum so these are various issues regarding the governance of puducherry so after this discussion you should try and answer this question from your mains examination point of view and with this let's move to the next article Now this article on page number eleven talks about the PM Kisan Yojana, which provides for annual transfer of rupees six thousand per household in three installments to farmers of India. Now recently there has been a change in the beneficiaries of this scheme, because earlier it provided for benefits to only small and marginal farmers. However, now the scope of this scheme has been broadened, and it will now include all categories of agricultural land owners. so this additional expansion would benefit an additional of 10% of rural landed households however it should be noted that it does not include tenant farmers or landless laborers now the various aspects of pm kisan yojana and its comparison with other schemes of the state government like the kalia scheme and the raithu bandhu schemes have been discussed in the dns of 2nd february 2019 So let us again revise those aspects of the PM Kisan Yojana from that video. So now regarding the PM Kisan Samman Nidhi Yojana, you should note that it provides an annual support of rupees six thousand, and it will be provided in three installments of rupees two thousand each. For that, it will benefit those farming families which own up to two hectares of land, and it will be entirely funded by the central government or the union government. The budget has allocated rupees twenty thousand crores for the current financial year, and rupees seventy five thousand crores have been allocated for the year two thousand nineteen to two thousand twenty. Now let us look at why was this scheme required at this point of time. Now you should note that this scheme was required because of the ongoing farm distress or the agrarian crisis, and this farm distress and agrarian crisis has been mainly due to the following reasons. The first in this line is the falling farm incomes. now we should note that the income of the farmers is falling day by day and this is because of lack of remunerative prices for the farm products secondly due to low domestic food inflation the prices of food products are falling rapidly and that is why the farmers are not able to make more profit we know that this has mainly been in the vegetable sector where the prices of onions etc have reduced considerably and that is why the profitability of farmers is decreasing The third important reason for increasing farm distress is the fragmented land holdings. Now we know that in various parts of India the density of population is very high and the land holding per family is very low. And due to small land holdings the farmers are not able to make more profit. Another reason for farm distress is the increasing indebtedness of the farmers. And we know that various small and marginal farmers are under debt because they are taking credit from non institutional sources like money lenders and these money lenders at times charge rates which are extremely high and that is why the farmers are not able to come out of this debt cycle and this has primarily been the reason for farmer suicides in various parts of india so all these reasons have led to the farm distress and agrarian crisis so that is why this scheme was required 
and this provides support to the incomes for the farming families and especially to the small and marginal farmers who have a land holding under 2 hectares. Further, this scheme provides for 6,000 rupees monetary support and this will be an income support for the farmers and it will also help farmers from falling in debt trap continuously. Now, after going through the reasons for farm distress or the agrarian crisis, let us look at the challenges that are likely to be faced during the implementation of this scheme. Now, the first challenge that is likely to surface is the non-digitization of land records. Now, here you should note that the digitization of land records will provide a clear idea about the beneficiaries and specially related to the titles of the beneficiary farming families. And you should note that these land records have not been adequately digitized. And that is why it will be difficult to identify the beneficiaries. Further, this scheme is likely to face various implementation issues. We note that in various cases of Aadhaar linked subsidy or the direct benefits transfer, many beneficiaries have been left out because of lack of biometric identification or the failure of biometric identification at times. So these are other likely implementation issues for this scheme. And the third and the foremost issue is the fiscal space in the government budget. This means that how is government going to finance this scheme? Although it has allocated 75,000 crores, it does not have the funds or the fiscal space for providing these benefits. So another important challenge in front of the government is that how it will raise such a big amount for financing these schemes. Now let us look at the various pros or the positives of this scheme that have been provided in these articles. The first is that this scheme will provide support over and above all the existing schemes for the farming sector. Now in this point you should note that the government has not reduced the benefits for the farmer under its existing schemes. For example, there has been no reduction in the benefits related to the schemes like the Pradhan Mantri Krishi Vikas Yojana or the Pradhan Mantri Fasal Bhima Yojana. So that is why this support will be over and above all the existing schemes for the farming sector. So that is why it will be an additional income for the farming families. The second positive aspect is that it is a pan India coverage scheme and it will benefit around 12 crore farming families. The third benefit is that it will provide the farming class with a sense of confidence. This is because they will get an assured amount of rupees 6000 per annum in three installments of rupees 2000. Finally, you should note that in this scheme, the beneficiary unit has been taken as a family. And we know that various small families are there in joint families. And that is why in large joint families, the accrued benefits will be larger. So this shows that the coverage is wide enough and it is likely to benefit the majority farming families in India, and especially these small and marginal farmers. Now let us look at some of the cons or the challenges and the negatives in this scheme. Now here you should note that this scheme provides for support of rupees 500 per family per month only. And this is not enough to alleviate the farm distress. This is because on an average, it will only form one fifth of the average household income in India. So in this line, it has been suggested that the benefits should be doubled for the farmers. And this doubling can be done by reducing various subsidies under food and fertilizer section. Further, another negative aspect of this scheme is that it does not cover tenant farmers and the landless agricultural laborers. And you should note that the tenant farmers and the landless agricultural laborers constitute majority of the below poverty line section of society. Further, there are other examples of schemes which provide for direct cash benefits to the farmers. And these include the Telangana's Raithu Bandhu scheme and the Odisha's Kalia scheme. And you should note that this scheme has also been inspired from these two schemes. However, the Telangana's Raithu Bandhu scheme provides a benefit of around 10,000 per annum. And similarly, the Odisha's Kalia scheme provides for rupees 25,000 benefit. So in this line, the scheme falls short of these two schemes. And finally, you should note that it would lead to recurring expenditure from the government's budget, which is already facing fiscal deficit. And as this scheme is a populist scheme, it will be hard to roll back such scheme. And this will also add to the fiscal deficit of the government. And we know that under the FRBM framework or the fiscal responsibility management framework, the government is bound to decrease its fiscal deficit. So this will be another challenge in front of the government while implementing this scheme. Now in the coming days, there will be various articles on the analysis related to this scheme. 
So all these points are important and can be used in answering questions related to the agricultural sectors. And a direct question can always be asked related to the challenges in the implementation of this scheme. So you should go through all these points. Now after going through today's discussion, you can try and answer these questions and the answer for these questions will be displayed after 5 seconds. Now the first question reads, consider the following pairs and it provides pairs of communities in news and the country to which they belong. So the first is Baloch and Pakistan which is correct. The second is Yazidi and Iraq which is also correct and the third is Madhesi and Nepal. This is also correct. Hence the correct answer here is D that is 1, 2 and 3. The second question reads, which of the following are true about renewable energy in India? The first statement reads, India has set a target of installed renewable energy capacity of 200 gigawatt by 2022. Now this is an incorrect statement because the target is of 175 gigawatts. Second statement reads, presently the installed capacity in renewable energy is the highest in solar sector. Now this statement is also incorrect as we have learned in today's article, the installed capacity is the highest for wind energy. So here the correct answer is D that is neither 1 nor 2. Further you should try and answer these questions. The answer for these questions will also be displayed after 5 seconds. So the first question reads, consider the following statements. The first is that article 239A was added by the 14th constitutional amendment which is correct. Second is that article 239AA deals with the governance of national capital territory of Delhi. Now both these statements are correct, hence the correct answer is both 1 and 2. The fourth question reads, NASA has recently tested the launch abort system for its Orion capsule. It is related to which of the following? So this question is related to the news article that appeared on page number 22. And this is related to the moon mission of NASA. With this we have come to the end of today's discussion. Now let's move on to the question for the day.